Hello, I'm Anthony David Hobbs, and this is my seventh Harry Potter review. This is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, Part 1. Now, the Harry Potter books, I read the first four, but I still have yet to read the other three. In a way, it's kind of cool doing it that way, because when I saw the first films, yes, I thought, very good adaptation, that is more or less what I envisioned when I read the book, yeah. But of course, from number five onwards... Uh, there was this unpredictability, not knowing what's going to happen, yeah, so in a way that was kind of cool, there were a lot of surprises and some shocks in store, yeah. I will read the other books, I just haven't got round to it. Anyway, this is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part one. And I remember it came out in the year 2010, that's an anagram of 2001 when the first film came out. Anyway, it was uh, called part one. Now, nobody had seen a movie, or more specifically the last movie, with a part one on the end like that. And uh, because, yes, the, the last story is divided into two films. So in other words, seven books but eight films. And yes, other franchises have picked up on this to make the last story more dramatic. They divide the last story into two parts, yeah. Is that a good idea? Well, it, it ends the story with a bang and of course makes more money. But for me it's a good thing it was made into two films because I haven't read the book. And it's a lot to take in, all these names of places and all these things happening. So, so yes, it, it makes it easier for it to take in, yeah. Anyway, um, okay, some nitpicks. <laughs> Basically, Hermione Granger, she erases the memories of her parents. So they don't know who she is, I don't remember having anything to do with her. Because this one is different to all the Harry Potter stories, in that the, the main characters never attend Hogwarts school. Their lives are in danger and they're always on the run. And Hermione Granger erases the memories of her parents. So very dramatic, very sad scene. But how does that help them? If their minds are erased, they don't know that her life is in danger and therefore they will not move home. If they never move home, the Death Eaters know where they are and know how to find them and kill them. So how does that help? That doesn't make any sense. Harry Potter, however, doesn't erase anyone's mind. No, he tells the Dursleys, you have to move, your lives are in danger. Yes, that's that, that's a more sensible move to do, yeah. Nothing wrong with erasing minds in a magical story, but you have to have a good reason for it. Well, later on, the big three, Hermione, Ron and Harry, are in London. Yes, London crops up a lot in these films. And she erases the memories of two evil wizards that are trying to kill them in a cafe. No, that makes logical sense. Yeah, that's a good reason, yeah. But this raises the question, can Hermione erase the minds of, of any Death Eaters? Can she erase the mind of Voldemort? Or is he too powerful? Would it work on him or not? Well, they don't raise that issue. Well, speaking of raising issues, in the last review I said very plainly that the Weasley's house is destroyed. It's all burnt down. In this film we see it again. A little bit damaged, but more or less intact. I'm like, no, 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 that's not right. I saw the Weasley's house utterly destroyed. I saw it with my own eyes. You can't just bring it back like that and no explanation. Did they rebuild it or was it not all that badly damaged? It looked pretty, it looked utterly destroyed to me in the last film, but there we are, apparently the Weasley's house is back. Uh, Bill Weasley, the eldest, I think, of the Weasleys, is he wants to marry Fleur. Do they actually get married? Well, anyway, the wedding ceremony is interrupted. Death Eaters here, there and everywhere. And, um, yes, it's a very dark, sinister story, but it's it's effectively, this movie is a road movie. Yes, they're always on the move, always on the run, yeah. Spoiler alert, Hedwig dies, very sad, that special owl. Mad-Eye Moody dies, yes, because this is the last film, or more or less the last film, so characters can die, because, you know, it's, it's going to end, you know. Yes, your mortality is very apparent in this story, yeah. The Ministry of Magic, Bill Nye plays um, the new Minister of Magic. Then they receive word later that he's been killed. And now the Ministry of Magic is run by the evil minions of Voldemort. Oh, no. So, yes, not only is it not safe in Hogwarts, it's not safe anywhere for magicians. Yes. The evil wizards run the place now, yeah. And there's a scene where, in the Ministry of Magic, these like leaflets and posters saying, get all the muggles out, get rid of all the mudbloods. It's a bit like Nazi Germany. Yes, all these propaganda things saying, get rid of all the impure bloods. Only pure bloods are allowed here. Only they have the right to use magic, yes. And um, uh, Ron, Hermione and Harry, 
and disguise themselves with Polydruce potions so they can get into the Ministry of Magic. They have to teleport there, and they teleport going through these public toilets. Totally disgusting and amusing at the same time. You have to stand with your foot in the toilet and it teleports you through. And then you, you're teleported into the Ministry of Magic. In a way, it's sort of symbolic as well. These new people that run the Ministry of Magic are totally evil. They're absolute scum of the earth. The sort of scum that you scrape off and flush down the toilet. Yes. Yes, yes. When something's disgusting and horrible, you get rid of it. Flush it down the toilet. So... Yes, for me the toilets are symbolic in that way. So, surrounded by absolute scum, the most evil wizards ever, and then we see Professor Umbridge. Now, she's not the Commander-in-Chief, but she's one of the main uh, leaders, the main people in control of the Ministry of Magic. And nobody's, nobody's forcing her. She seems to do this very willingly. She's very willingly uh, promoting all these more evil wizards. Wait a minute. If she's joined them of her own free will... Does that mean she was evil all along? Yes, back in the fifth film. Does that mean she was evil then? Yeah. Well, if she was, that's a double, double cross then, isn't it? Yeah, she's totally evil. And the three lead characters are frightened by the mere sight of her. Yeah, but they're, they're relatively safe because they're in disguise. And, of course, at the beginning of the film, Harry Potter... Oh, yeah, Mad-Eye Moody, before he dies, disguises six other people to look like Harry Potter to throw the assassins off guard. So the number seven is symbolic, because that's a total of seven Harry Potters. Except the number seven is not that symbolic, because there's eight films. There's seven books, but not but eight films, yeah. Anyway, um, Harry Potter states quite plainly, we must destroy the Horcruxes. This is just never going to end. The only way we'll have peace it, it, to save our lives is to destroy all the Horcruxes, then Voldemort will be destroyed once and for all. And then afterwards, it's not just personal. No, it's not to save their own personal lives. If magic has any future at all, they must destroy Voldemort. Because now Voldemort's minions have taken over the Ministry of Magic. So the stakes are far higher than they've ever been before. Before, in like the first couple of movies, uh, Voldemort was a bit of a nuisance. Now he's, ra he's, yes, he's a threat to the whole, the whole world of magic now. Anyway, the Horcrux, they go to the elf called Creature that belongs to Sirius Black, or used to belong to him. But he only has a copy of the Horcrux. They have to get the real one that's in the Ministry of Magic itself. They have to steal it off Professor Umbridge. They've got the, the Horcrux, but they can't find anything to destroy it. And then, about halfway through the film, it's just these three characters. And uh, Ron wears the like locket or, or medallion, whatever the proper name for it is, around his neck. And after wearing it for too long, he starts getting vicious and aggressive and mean and... Wait a minute, that's Lord of the Rings. If you wear the ring around your neck for too long, it makes you aggressive and mean. Yes, that's unoriginal. You could look at it that way, or you could say, well, Lord of the Rings itself wasn't 100% original either. Anyway, so they decide to take it in turns to wear the Horcrux ring around their neck. And, um, oh yes, at one point, Ron, he listens to the radio to hear any news if his family are safe or not. Wait a minute, you're on the run. Your lives are in danger. Radio signals can be traced. So that doesn't make logical sense, does it? Yeah. And then later, um, oh, Ron has a falling out and he's off. And then for a short time, halfway through the film, it's just Hermione and, and Harry. Now, normally in Harry Potter films, we have loads of characters, loads of people talking here, there and everywhere. So it's very different. Just two characters talking and nobody else. Yeah. But then that's a good thing. Yes, this is very different to what we've seen before. It's... J.K. Rowling is showing that, yes, they're not all the same. The movies can be different, yeah. Anyway, it's Hermione that works out the only thing that can destroy a Horcrux is um, the, the Sword of Gryffindor. Wait a minute, didn't a fang destroy the diary? Oh, but it had some help from the Sword of Gryffindor. So, yes, to destroy the Horcruxes, you need the Sword of Gryffindor, yeah. And uh, they get it. Uh, Harry Potter's almost killed trying to get it, but then at the last minute, Ron helps him. So, yes, they've got the Sword of Gryffindor. They destroy the Horcrux. Later we see, um, not Luna Lovegood, but her father, you know, Mr. Lovegood, and he betrays them, basically. He turns them over to the, the evil uh, Death Eaters, but then that's because they're holding his daughter. Luna is a prisoner, and they said, either you hand, hand them over to us, otherwise we'll kill her. So the life of his daughter is deemed more important. Then Harry and his friends decide, we've got to go to this dungeon that's at the Malfoy's house. We've got to save Luna, save the Wandmaker... 
save the Gringotts Goblin. Yes, yeah, so they've got their work cut out for them. They've got a lot of people to save, yes. But then Dobby, everyone's favourite house elf, although he's a bit of a wimp, he does have very powerful magic for teleporting, so he can help them that way. And Draco Malfoy, yes, he does help the evil wizards and all this, but he helps them rather reluctantly. It's like he's being pressured into it, you know, family pressures and all that. He's like, no, I can't do this. I'm a school bully, I'm not a murderer, you know. <laughs> so yes, he's he's a bit of a reluctant villain, yeah. Anyway, um, with his magic, Dobby manages to, to rescue the, the prisoners, yes. And there's a bit where he's quite brave, when he steals a witch's wand, and the witch goes, How dare you! You're a puny little elf! You will know your place! You're a slave! You just do as you're told! How dare you steal a wand! And Dobby says, Dobby has no masters! Dobby is not slave! Dobby helps his friends! So yes, yes, this wimpy little guy is very brave. Unfortunately, his, um, his glory doesn't last very long, because... Later he's killed, but not before he teleports his friends to safety. And with his dying breath, he says, Dobby is happy to be friends with Harry. Dobby has died a happy elf. So, yes, yes, the theme of death comes up a lot in this, yes. And the Deathly Hallows are the ones that, um, an old story, one has an all-powerful wand, one has an all-powerful stone that can bring the dead back to life, and the invisibility cloak, yeah. So, yes, the three Deathly Hallows, and uh, the symbol, the triangle, and the circle, and the line, yeah. So, yes, the Deathly Hallows found ways, the ultimate magic, to cheat death. Ironically, because the three of them ended up dead. But anyway, but before... Even though they ended up dead, their, their objects, their possessions, were, were still very much intact. The Invisibility Cloak, I haven't seen that stone, but at the end of the film we see the magic wand. So, um, Voldemort does a bit of grave robbing. Yes, that's how low he sinks. Rob's a grave to get to get the uh, the magic wand, and now he's all powerful. He has the most powerful wand of all, and that's how the story ends. So yes, very enjoyable film on the run. The stakes are much higher than they ever were before. Yes, these heroes being tested to the limit. It shows a lot, but not too much. It still leaves you wanting for more. Yeah. So yes, overall, very enjoyable film. Thank you for watching. I'm Anthony Hobbs, and I'm never bored.